Well, I invite you this morning to take your Bibles and open, please, to the Gospel of Mark. Open to Mark chapter number 9. The Gospel of Mark chapter 9. And uh, this morning I want to speak on the glory of Christ. If you look in Mark chapter 9 and look in verse 1, I want to read a few verses with you, starting at verse number 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, and leadeth them up into the high mountain, apart from them uh, by themselves, and when he was he was transformed before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Now, when I come to a passage like this, frankly, I'm very intimidating. Uh, uh, intimidated, not intimidating. <laughs> Get that right. I can be intimidating, but, uh, but no, this passage intimidates me because it, it's, it's about something that's so very difficult to describe. I kind of feel like Peter in verse 6, for he said, for he wist not what to say, for he was sore afraid. This passage reveals the glory of Christ at the Mount of Transfiguration experience. Uh, what can anyone say to describe an experience like this? You talk about a mountaintop experience. This was the ultimate mountaintop experience. Peter would later refer back to this in 2 Peter when he talked about seeing the glory of God, hearing the voice of the Father from heaven. Uh, and so really what Peter got was kind of a foretaste of the glory of the kingdom. So really, what can I uh, add to this glorious event, which one commentator described as the most significant event between Christ's birth and passion? We've all heard the expression that someone is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. And I suppose that there are people that are like that. They're so, uh, their heads are so much in the clouds, they don't accomplish much in practical terms. But the truth of the matter is, most of us are so earthly minded that we're no earthly or heavenly good. And this is especially true lately with all this going on in our world. We seem to be all focused on the things around us in this time of the coronavirus and the, the protest and the rioting and the political division and the anger and all these things that are going on. It just seems like our world has gone crazy. It's gone mad. It's very easy to get caught up in all of the drama and all of the anger that's going on around us. And as I said in my prayer, the world around us might be shaking, but God's kingdom is unshakable. The Bible is clear, however, if we want to walk in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord, we have to set our mind on things that are above, where Christ is seated on the right hand, the Bible says. And there's nothing quite so practical as gaining a, a, a clearer vision of the glory of Christ. Now, like Peter, James, and John, we're going to find out they had to come down off the mountain. They couldn't stay up there. Uh, they had to come down to the valley to deal with the difficulty that was in their world. And we are like that. But we can better deal with those difficulties if we have a clear vision of the glory of Christ. So that's what I want us to see, hopefully, in this sermon today. Now, to understand the transfiguration, we have to see it in the context. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark was gradually revealing to us, the reader, and to uh, the disciples, Jesus was re revealing to the disciples who he was, his identity. And they were beginning to get the picture. You have to remember, they were growing in their understanding of Christ. And finally, it got to the point to where Peter made the ultimate confession. You remember, Jesus asked them, who do, who do you say that I am? And they said, well, Lord, some people say that you're John the Baptist, and some people say you're Elijah returned. Some people say you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But go back to chapter 8, look at verse 27. Peter makes the ultimate confession. And uh, look at verse 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, some say Elias, and one of the prophets Verse 29, and he said unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell none of them, no man of him. Now, this was the high point of testimony in Mark's gospel. Everything in Mark came down before Peter's declaration leads up to it. 
Everything that came down leads up to it. Everything that followed after flows from it. To acknowledge that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, is to make the right confession. This is the right judgment. And Peter is going to have his judgment or his confession affirmed right after that on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ, but he did that by divine revelation. You remember what Jesus said, flesh and blood haven't revealed that to you, Peter. You didn't pick that up on your own. This was revealed to you by God. And by the way, that's the way anyone really understands who Jesus is. You're not going to really understand who he is unless God the Father opens your eyes so that you can see that he indeed is the Son of God. But now what Peter affirmed by faith uh, would be confirmed physically with his eyes because he would see the divine glory of Christ. And so it's immediately right after this confession that the Bible says that Jesus takes them to the Mount of Transfiguration. He begins to tell them of what's going to happen about his death. In fact, look in, uh, notice Mark chapter 8, look down at verse 31, just to get you the context. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. Verse 32, and he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. Boy, Peter had a real high moment, but now here's a real low one. He confessed that Jesus was the Christ, and now when Jesus began to unfold to him the plan, and the plan was for Jesus to suffer and die and then resurrect, Peter began to rebuke him. And Jesus recognized that was not you, Peter, that's Satan speaking through you. But this was God's plan. Jesus makes it plain that those who follow him must follow the way of the cross. Again, look at verse 34 of chapter 8. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus did not come to please himself, but to do the will of the Father, which included the cross. Those who are his disciples must also deny themselves. They also must take up the cross, and they must follow Christ, even if that means persecution, even if that means being very unpopular to the world. And by the way, we're living in a time when the church is becoming more and more unpopular. And there's going to come a time when to preach a simple sermon from the Word of God, affirming the truth of God's Word, is going to be called hate speech. But that doesn't really matter. We pick up our cross, we follow Christ, whether it's popular, whether it brings persecution, whatever. And then right after all of this, look in chapter 9, verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. So at this point, Jesus says to his disciples, there are some of you here that are not going to die until you see the glory of the kingdom. Now, what does that mean? This has been a very difficult verse for some to interpret. Some liberals say that it was a mistaken prediction by Jesus. Well, we know that Jesus can't make any mistakes. So that we throw that idea out. And there are others who say that this relates to the destruction of Jerusalem, which took place in 70 AD. But I have a trouble seeing how that event relates to the kingdom of God and his glory. Others see this as a reference to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But I think that what Jesus is referring to here is something more spectacular. I agree with many of the early church fathers who believe that Jesus was referring to the event that immediately follows what he says here in chapter 9, verse number 1, and that is the transfiguration. If you look at the word kingdom in verse 1, the Greek word here, basilia, can actually mean royal splendor. And I think Jesus was speaking about the transfiguration, which would be witnessed by Peter and James and John, these three disciples got a glimpse of what Jesus would look like or what it would be like in that coming kingdom when Jesus would come in glory with the glory of the Father and all the angels. This would be the most transcendent miracle recorded in all of the New Testament 
leading up to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these disciples would be privileged to see that very glory of Christ. What a privilege to see the glory of Jesus. Now, by the way, here's the good news. All of us are going to see that one day. All of us are going to see that. You say, how do you know that? Well, because Jesus prayed for that. John 17, 24, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Jesus' prayer is that we would behold him in his glory. We see the humiliation of Christ in his earthly ministry, and his prayer is he wants all of us to see the full, effulgent, manifest glory of Christ. And God the Father always hears the prayers of Jesus. That's how I know that I'm going to see it one day. And if you are saved, you are going to see it too. By the way, that's the reason I know I'm not going to lose my salvation also. Because if I lose my salvation, then this prayer of Jesus for me and for you is not answered. And God always answers the prayers of his son. And when we see the glory of Christ, this is going to be a source of great rejoicing and joy for all of us. But let me be quick to point out, that we who are truly saved, we already have seen the glory of Christ to a certain manner. If you're here and you know Jesus as your Savior, already God has opened your eyes for you to see who Jesus is. You've already seen the glory of Christ to a degree. Now, not like Peter, James, and John will see it on the Mount of Mount of Transfiguration. Grant you that. That's going to happen for us all one day. But already you have seen somewhat of the glory of Christ. Listen to this verse, such an important verse. You should mark it down. 2 Corinthians 4, 6. This is describing what happened to us at our salvation. Listen, for God who commanded light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what happened to you when, you, when we got saved. When you got saved, when I got saved, you know what happened? God turned the light on in our dark heart, and we were able to see with eyes of faith the glory of Jesus Christ. That is to say, we really made the same confession that Peter made. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. God revealed to us who Jesus is. He is the Christ. And because of that, we professed our faith in Christ. God opened our spiritual eyes. What a privilege that is. But there's a sense in which this glory that we have seen of Christ, it's somewhat veiled. We haven't seen the full manifestation of the glory of Christ. We've seen a little bit of it. Again, here's another verse, 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed in the same image from glory to glory. And again, Paul is describing what happened at salvation. What happened to us at salvation is this. We saw the glory of Christ, but we saw it through a glass. And by the way, the word for glass there is the Greek word, which means mirror. And the mirrors that they had back in Paul's day were not really glass. They were polished metal. Have you ever seen your reflection on polished metal? It's not a very clear image of you, is it? It's kind of cloudy. It's kind of foggy. You can see somewhat that image on that polished metal, not like our mirrors today. That's the way we see the glory of Christ. By the way, what is the mirror? It's the Word of God. When we come to God's house and we go into the Scripture, we see the glory of Christ. It's not the full, complete picture. It's not the full, complete glory that we'll see one day, but we see it in a glass. We see it in a mirror. We see it darkly, as Paul said in another place, and yet we've seen it. And one day we will see that full glory. What a privilege that will be. Now, the, the wonderful thing is, is that for Peter, James, and John, they got our early preview of what it's going to be like in that day when we all see the glory of Jesus Christ. We weren't there on that mountaintop experience, but it's recorded here for us, and we can learn some things from it. But here's the one idea. I'm, let me give you the whole certain sermon in one sentence, but you, have, you can't leave. You have to listen to the rest of it, all right? Here's the whole sermon in one sentence. When God gives us the privilege of seeing the glory of Christ, we should respond properly to that. 
So let me just give you two points here today. Number one, God delights in revealing the glory of Christ to us. He delights in doing that. Because all throughout biblical history, God has endeavored to reveal his glory to mankind. Remember in the Garden of Eden, when the Bible says God walked with Adam in the garden? How was that? That was the Shekinah glory of God. The word Shekinah is a word that means to dwell or to reside. Adam and Eve live with the Shekinah glory of God's presence. The Bible says that God dwells in in light. You know, God doesn't have a body the way we do. He dwells in light. And this is kind of mysterious. It's hard for us to understand. But whenever in the Old Testament God physically appeared, it was with some glorious, beautiful light that, that was just incredibly bright that really no man could approach, especially if God manifested that full glory. No man could see that and live. And so God would always give a measure of his glory. He would reveal it to man, and God expected a proper response when that glory was revealed. And there's a sense in which all of his perfections, all of his attributes are rolled up into that, and it's manifested in this glorious light. To use an analogy, it's what wet is to water. It's what heat is to the sun. That glory is revealed. And Adam and Eve saw it, but of course they sinned and they had to leave. When do we see it again in the Old Testament? We see it on the face of Moses. Remember in Exodus 34, 29, he would go up to Mount Sinai into the presence of the Lord. His face would light up like a light bulb. He would come down to the people. The first time he came down, the people were shocked when they saw Moses. Remember, he had to wear a veil because people were afraid. But God revealed his glory on the face of a man. And then God revealed his glory in the wilderness Remember, he led Israel with a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. That was God's glory leading them through the wilderness. It appeared on the tabernacle. You remember in the Old Testament, the tabernacle was in the center of the camp. All the Jewish tribes had a specific location around the tabernacle, and the glory cloud would come and descend down on the top of the tabernacle and rest there, and all of the Israelites in the camp could look up and see that glory. It was God again revealing his glory to man. It was God saying, uh, you know, here I am, reverence me, worship me, recognize who I am, give me proper reverence. We see it again in the temple. The Bible says that when Solomon completed the temple during the dedication service, that the glory cloud came down into the temple, and it was so great, it was so awesome, that the priests had to get out of there or they would have died. God manifested his glory there. And then you know where else we see it in the Old Testament? In Ezekiel chapter 8. And it's the story when the glory cloud lifted up off of the temple, went out through the eastern gate, went up to the Mount of Olives, ascended up and it left. The whole nation saw the glory leave Jerusalem and leave the temple. Why was God leaving? Because of the idolatry. God was fed up with the idolatry and God said, that's it, I'm done, I'm gone. And he left. The glory was gone. When do, we, when do we see that glory again in the Bible? We don't see it again until in the ministry of Christ. Jesus is that glory. He brought it back. Remember what John said? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his, his glory. John is referring in that verse to this particular occasion on the Mount, uh, Mount of Transfiguration when he and Peter and James were privileged to see the glory of God again in an incredible way. And let me tell you some things about this glory. First of all, it was a glory that was shrouded in humanity. Look in verse 2. And after six days, Jesus taken with him Peter, James, and John and leaded them up into a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. The word transfigured is metamorpho, where we get our word metamorphosis. This appears four times in the New Testament. Always it refers to a radical transformation. It talks about something, the inward nature of something coming out. That's the idea. Biologists use this word to talk about a caterpillar when he turns into a butterfly. We might say that the inward nature of the butterfly was shrouded in that caterpillar until later that inward nature came out. That's exactly what happened with Christ. The inward nature of his glory was shrouded in his humanity. When people saw Jesus, they didn't see anything particularly different about him on his human body. In fact, 
What does the Bible say? He was despised and rejected of men. There is no beauty that we would desire of him, they, they said. No form of majesty that we should look upon him. The religious experts didn't really know who he was. The people around them didn't know who he was. He came from the wrong town, Nazareth, didn't go to the right schools. But you know what? That inward glory they could not see. On this occasion, and by the way, let me say this. That's the way it is for us believers. You know, the world doesn't really recognize who we really are in Christ. The Bible says we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That we have, there's a sense in which we contain some of the glory of Christ because Christ lives in us. And all the world may look upon us outwardly, they don't really understand who we are inwardly, just like Jesus. So this was a glory that was shrouded in humanity. But another thing, it was a glory that surpassed any on earth. Look at verse 3. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can whiten them. Matthew's gospel said he shone like the sun. And Mark here says his garments became radiant, incredibly white. Luke says that they became white and gleaming, literally to flash or gleam like lightning. I love what Mark said at the end of verse 3, so that no fuller, we could say launderer on earth, could whiten them. His clothes became so white, there's no soap, no bleach, no dry cleaning service that could ever come close to whitening those garments like Jesus had. If I ever open up a dry cleaning store, I'm going to call it Mount Transfiguration Dry Cleaning. By the way, the Romans invented dry cleaning. They found certain chemicals and substances they could use, and so they would bleach their togas white. You know, you might think that this is kind of an odd comparison, but think about it. The gospel writers have a very difficult task. How do they describe the effulgent glory of Christ? I mean, what are you going to use? They compare it to the sun. They compare it to lightning, to snow. Mark simply says, you've never seen dry cleaning like this. And Mark's point is simply this. No one on earth has ever seen anything that could compare to the astonishing brilliance and glory of Christ. There's nothing on earth like it. That's his whole point. The glory of Christ surpasses anything on earth. And here's another thing about this glory. It's a glory that is superior to the prophets. Look at verse 4. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Now, scholars debate the significance of Moses and Elijah appearing with Christ. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. So we could say law and prophets. That's the whole Old Testament. Both had a unique death. Moses died on a mountaintop. God buried him. Elijah never died. He was carried away by a uh, chariot of fire into heaven. I think Moses represents the believers who died. When Jesus comes back, there will be some believers who were buried, died and buried. Elijah represents the believers who are still alive when Jesus returns, and they will be caught away in a rapture. Again, this is all a preview about the second coming. When Jesus returns, he will raise the bodies of those who died. He will rapture the saints with him there into heaven. And in Luke's account that says that they were talking, it tells us what they were talking about. They were talking about the death of Jesus. So this is an incredible thing. I mean, put yourself in their place. Here they are. Jesus transfigures before them. Moses and Elijah are talking with them. They're talking about the death of Christ. This is just an incredible, incredible mountaintop experience. But what we need to see is that the glory of Christ surpasses the glory of the Old Testament. It surpasses the glory of those prophets. These were two of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. They each revealed somewhat the glory of, of God. Elijah was carried away on a glorious chariot. Moses had the glory of God on his face. But the glory that Moses had on his face was a reflected glory. It was not his own. He was simply reflecting the glory of God. Jesus was the glory of God. His glory surpassed that of the Old Testament prophets. But here's another thing I want you to see. It is a glory that is shared with the believer. The reason Jesus invited the disciples up there was to, com to communicate that message. Jesus invites his people to share in his glory. And by the way, we are all going to do that. That's the whole point. Jesus was giving them a lesson, suffering then glory. 
carry your cross, follow me, and the suffering will come, but the glory will take place after that. And Peter, remember that in 1 Peter 1.7, he wrote this, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold, though it be tried by fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus. He wasn't talking about the glory of Jesus at the appearing. He was talking about our glory when Jesus comes back. If you faithfully serve the Lord and you go through trials faithfully, when you come back, you're going to have glory. That's the whole point. And so the transfiguration points this out. And by the way, Paul also said this. Did you know that one day in heaven, we, are, we will shine with the glory of God? We'll have a body that will shine with glory. Paul said there's one glory of the sun, another of the moon, another of stars. But he said, so also is the resurrection of the dead. And the whole point is, all of us will have a glorified body. We will shine with the glory of God. Some will shine brighter than others. Well, what will determine that? Your faithfulness to the Lord here on earth will determine the glory that you have in heaven one day. All of us will share in that glory. So what an incredible privilege. Oh, and let me just tell you one other thing. In heaven, we will live in that glory. Listen to Revelation 21, 3, 23. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb, the lamb is the light thereof. What will be the light of heaven? It won't be the sun or the moon. It will be the glory of God. Now, so God delights in revealing his glory to us. Now, here's the second point. God expects us to respond properly to that privilege. Each time God reveals his glory, God was saying to people, see my glory, focus on it, recognize who I am, and give me proper reverence. Uh, when God opens our eyes, he expects us to respond in the right way. When we respond in the wrong way, it brings anger from God. You know what the Bible says? The worst indictment against man is when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. That's why the wrath of God is on the world in many ways today, even though it's mingled with his mercy. The reason God is angry or has wrath is because when God has revealed himself to man, man pushes it away. They knew God, but they glorified him not as God. God wants us to respond the right way. What's the right way to respond? Let me just give you four things and we'll be done. First of all, surrendered will. Look at verse number five. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Now, Peter wanted to stay on the mountaintop. He didn't want to leave. We're like that when we have these great mountaintop experiences. We never want to leave. So Peter said, oh, Lord, let's build three tabernacles and stay here. First of all, it took a lot of nerve for him to interrupt the conversation between Jesus and Elijah and Moses. That took a lot of nerve. I mean, if I see Jesus and Elijah and Moses in my office talking, I think I'm just going to let them talk and listen. Peter's suggestion, and by the way, this was not God's will. God's will was not for them to dwell there on that mountain. God revealed his glory on the mountain that they might use that to motivate them to minister to other people in the valley. Peter's suggestion reflects human thinking, not divine wisdom. Yeah, it would be wonderful to stay on the mountain, to bask in the glory. But discipleship is all about denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Christ. You can't do that if you selfishly stay on the mountain of glory. There are needs in the valley. You have to go back down into the valley. If you, we want to share the glory of Christ on the mountaintop, we have to be willing to go through the suffering in the valley below. We can't live on the mountain. And you know what? The world needs to see in the church today, it needs to see the glory of Christ in us. In this confused world today, in this world where there are so many voices shouting and there's so much anger, you know what they need to see in the church? They need to see the glory of Christ. They need to see in the believer's life. They need to see that Christ is the answer. Not the schemes of men, not the philosophies of men, not anyone's political agenda. None of that is the answer. The answer is Christ. And they need to see that in the church. They need to see that in the believer. 
So there has to be a, a, a submissive will, a surrendered will. Secondly, a quiet spirit. Look at verse number six. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. Again, Peter, he didn't know what to say. Normally, a good rule of thumb is when you don't know what to say, just don't say anything. But that's not Peter's personality. He hated silence. Someone said Peter was the disciple with the foot-shaped mouth because he was always sticking his foot in his mouth. Look at God the Father's response, verse 7. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved Son, hear him. Translation, Peter, will you be quiet? Will you listen to my Son? You can't talk and listen at the same time. And God the Father interrupts Peter's speech to get them focused back on what? On the Word of God. On the Word of Christ. We need that same interruption today. We need to get back to the Word of God. It surprises me how even those who name the name of Christ are so willing to leave the Word of God and pursue other ideas. When the Word of God is sufficient, get back to the Word of God. Hear him. Listen to the words of Christ. And by the way, to build a tabernacle for, for Jesus and, and, and Moses and Elijah, you know what that's doing? That is equating Jesus with the other two. He's not on their, on their same plane. He's not equal to them. He's superior to them. He's far greater. He's far superior. And let me just say, the words of Christ are far superior to any ideas or philosophy that any man can conjure up. He's far superior. And then here's the next proper response, a focused mind. Look in verse number 8. Look at verse 8. And suddenly, when they had looked around about, they saw no man anymore, save Jesus only. I love the way that reads. Jesus only. It's no accident that immediately after they heard the voice, they looked around and there was Jesus only. And there's a message there. Again, don't put Jesus on the same level as all these men, even the greatest of saints. What we must do is, is not focus on men, but focus on Christ. Focus on his glory. And then let me give you a, the final thing here. An obedient heart. An obedient heart. Look down at verse number 9. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. As they were coming down, Jesus commanded them, don't tell others. They couldn't fully grasp for one thing, all that had taken place. Later they would. But he said, for now, don't tell anyone. Not until after my resurrection. Then you can tell, but before that, don't tell anyone. In a sense, God the Father already said, listen, hear him, obey him, listen to him. Obey Christ. This had to be a difficult command to obey after having that experience. Don't tell anyone especially when they saw the other disciples. You know how they were always competing? Well, have I got something to tell you? What is it? I can't tell you. I'll tell you later. But they obeyed. You see, the path of obedience, as we have already seen, is the way of self-denial, the way of daily crucifixion to our sinful desires, it means continually losing our selfish lives for Jesus' sake, seeking his kingdom above anything else. We should be more concerned and more focused on his kingdom than anything else. Again, I know that we're, we're living in a world today where it's easy to be distracted. But remember the words of Jesus. Remember when he was before Pilate and Pilate had kind of said, well, you know, your people brought you to me. You're supposed to be their king. Why are you here? Remember what Jesus said? My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. But my kingdom is not of this world. What is happening in this world today has nothing to do with his kingdom. Again, this world might be shaking, but his kingdom is not. His kingdom is going forward. His kingdom is victorious. And the path of obedience is following Jesus and putting his kingdom first, we should be more concerned about his kingdom than what's going on in this world and getting out the gospel. 
So focus on the glory of Christ. This is a privilege that God has given us. We should focus on the glory of Christ, and God expects us as a result to respond properly to that. Let me end with this. At the end of World War II, there was a man named Murdo McDonald. He spoke to his American colleagues through a fence of a German concentration camp. They were prisoners that were there. And he told them that the, of the news that the war was over. He basically told them that Germany was defeated, the Allies had won. It, they would still be there for a few more days, but the Germans would soon learn the news. And during those three days, those Americans who were prisoners in that camp They still suffered poor food. They still were mistreated. They still were confined. They still had hardship there in that camp. Nothing had changed except for the news that they had won, that their situation would be different. Suddenly there was hope. Victory was assured. You know what that meant? They could endure those trials because they knew what the end was. You see, the transfiguration of Jesus gives us a glimpse of the glory that we will share in his kingdom that is coming, you can rest assured, beloved, that the victory is ours. You can rest assured of that. And this will enable us to follow him. And this time, follow him, be obedient to him, pick up our cross, and follow him. Let's, Let's bow for prayer together. So, Father, we thank you for this beautiful glimpse of glory. Lord, I pray that this will be something that we don't forget, that we will be mindful of the great privilege that you have given us as your people, to have our our spiritual eyes open to know who Jesus is, to know that he is the glory of God. And although we see this glory, it is cloudy, it is faint, We know that one day we will see the full glory of Christ when he returns. And we will share in that glory. We know that victory for us is assured. And Lord, armed with this knowledge, help us to go into the valley and minister to the needs of people as you would have us do. And Lord, if there's someone here today that's never had their eyes open to see the glory of Christ, I pray, Father, you'll do that. I pray that there'll be people here that will come to Christ realizing He is the only way. He is the Savior of the world. That They would put their faith in His finished work on Calvary, knowing that that's the only way to have eternal life. Not what we do, it's what He has done for us. And beloved, if you're listening today and that's your prayer, would you just simply reach out in faith and say that to God? Just pray and tell Him, Lord, I'm trusting you and you alone as my way of salvation. Save me, Lord Jesus. I turn from my sin. I turn to you. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I put my faith in you and you alone. Jesus only. Father, hear that prayer. Honor that prayer. Save souls for your glory's sake. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.